Welcome to my channel, I'm Scott, and in this video I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Salesforce's stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Salesforce is the number one CRM company in the world. CRM is a popular term used today. It stands for Customer Relationship Management. It is the technology for managing all your company's relationships and interactions with customers and potential customers. A CRM system helps companies stay connected to customers, streamline processes, and improve profitability. Other popular CRM platforms are HubSpot, Oracle NetSuite, Zendesk, and many more. The company is headquartered in San Francisco, California and was founded in 1999. The ticker trades on the New York Stock Exchange, Deutsche Börse, Mexican Bolsa, Zicha, Vienna, Euro TLX, Swiss, Sao Paulo, Buenos Aires, Bulgaria, Kazakhstan, and London Stock Exchange. Let's get started with the model. This is a large cap company, 204 billion market cap. They're trading at 207 a share, and they have 985 million shares outstanding. Let's look at their financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. Their free cash flow grows every year from 2.8 billion to 5.3 billion. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And that was really high in 2021. In 2022 is 1.4 billion. Revenue is a sales for the company and that doubles from 2019 to 2022 over 26 billion of revenue. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue of the sales and below that is the cost of revenue. These are all the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. The cost to maintain that software is part of cost of revenue. Revenue minus cost of revenue gives you your gross profit and that almost doubles from 2019 to 2022. Below that is their operating expenses. Their biggest operating expense by far is marketing, and below that is their operating income, which is fairly steady year to year, around half a billion dollars. And the reason they had such a big net income in 2021 was this large gain of 2.1 billion. I would ignore things in other income and expenses because these are not part of the company's day-to-day -day operations. I would just focus on operating income. Most of these gains are non-cash items. These are the gains on its investments in other companies. You can see how volatile their net income is compared to their operating income. This is the company's income statement directly from their quarterly report. And this shows us 2021, 2022, the three months ending 131, 21, and 22. Their revenue is up from 5.8 billion to 7.3 billion. Most of their revenue is from subscriptions, 6.8 billion. Here's a breakdown of their subscription revenue, 1.6 billion from sales, 1.7 billion from services, 1.4 billion from their platform, 1 billion from marketing, and 1.1 billion from data. And it's gone up in every single category. A great thing about investing in a company like this, it's really easy for them to scale. At a fairly low cost, they can sell their product all over the world. Most of their revenue comes from the US, 4.9 billion in the Americas, and that includes North and South America, but a majority is in North America. Europe is 1.7 billion and Asia Pacific 670 million, and their revenue has increased in each region. They also generated half a billion from professional services. These are additional services outside the normal scope of the company's operations. They lose money from professional services. The cost of revenue is 558 million, against revenue of 500 million. But this is a loss leader. This is just a way to get new customers because their margins are phenomenal with their subscription service. The cost of revenue is 2 billion, so their gross profit is 5.3 billion. Technology companies tend to have really good margins. Their gross margin is 73%, which is a lot better than their industry. They spent 1.3 billion in R&D, 3.5 billion of marketing, and 700 million of GNA, which gives them an operating loss of 176 million. Last year was an operating gain of 193 million. They had negative net income in the current quarter. That's a loss of three cents per share. On the bottom of the income statement, you can see the shares outstanding. They did have 908 million, now they're up to 986 million. 
but they did beat their earnings and revenue in the current quarter. They reported their earnings this month in March and their earnings were 84 cents a share. That's adjusted earnings and their target was 74 cents. So they beat it by 10 cents. It's confusing when you look at the income statement and they had a loss of three cents per share, but they're saying they had an 84 cent per share gain. Adjusted earnings adds back depreciation, amortization, and also unusual items. I'm not a big fan when I see the word adjusted. I'd rather look at the income statement myself and try to understand it better than just rely on what the company tells me. They did beat their revenue. It was 7.33 billion and the target was 7.24 billion. I like revenue better because you can't adjust it. It is what it is. With net income and most other numbers, there's a lot of accounting tricks going on where you can manipulate the numbers and adjust them to your favor. If you're curious why they had negative net income with higher revenue when compared to the three months ending 13121, it's easiest to look at percentages. And fortunately, this company provides that in their reporting. Their cost of revenue was 27% of their revenue. Last year it was 25%. You would expect as revenue increases, your cost of revenue should go down. You should become more efficient. So that gave them a lower gross profit. Their gross profit was 73% of their revenue. Last year it was 75%. And they spent more in R&D and marketing as a percent of revenue when compared to last year. So that gives them an operating loss of 2% of their revenue. Last year was an operating gain of 3% of their revenue. And to make it even worse, they passed through a loss of 3% of their revenue. And last year they passed through a gain of 7% of their revenue. Looking at numbers as a percent is better because it gives you more information. Of course, you would expect R&D and marketing to go up because revenue is higher when compared to last year. But not only did it go up, it went up more as a percent of revenue. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates from its operational business. This gives us a better picture of how the company's doing operating cash flow because you can't really manipulate cash too much. They are generating a healthy amount of cash flow and it's going up each year. They do spend a good amount in CapEx. That's mostly on their software infrastructure. Operating cash flow minus CapEx give you your free cash flow. And a free cash flow is a cash that's remaining for you, the investor. They do not pay a dividend with the free cash flow. The way they help the investor is they invest back into the business to grow it. So hopefully the stock price increases. They also add a lot of debt. They added almost 8 billion in 2022. They did pay down 1.2 billion. So their debt load increased 6.7 billion in 2022. They also added 3 billion of debt in 2019. Their investing cash flows are really big, negative 14 billion, negative 4 billion, negative 3 billion, and negative 5.4 billion. When you buy another company, the amount you paid for that company goes into investing cash flow. So they do lots of acquisitions. This is the operating cash flow section directly from their financial reporting. And this is 2021, 2022, the last quarter of 2021, and the last quarter of 2022. So even though they reported a net loss, they actually generated 2 billion of cash flow. The reason was these three big non-cash items that brought down their net income, 900 million of depreciation, 350 million of amortization, and 760 million of stock-based compensation. You also have to adjust for change in the working capital, but it looks like most of these numbers cancel each other out. Accounts receivables cancels out unearned revenue and capitalized revenue contracts cancels out accounts payable. Their revenue has increased like a rocket ship. Their operating cash flow has been increasing, but at a slower rate. Their revenue is projected to continue increasing at a strong pace. Their operating cash flow is expected to increase at a moderate pace. This is the investing and financing sections from the statement of cash flows. In 2021, they spent 1.3 billion in acquisitions. In 2022, it was 15 billion. They spent 1.7 billion in strategic investments. This type of investment is usually in exchange for shares of the smaller company. This allows Salesforce to protect their investment and also to control that smaller company. They did sell 2.2 billion of strategic investments. In their investing section, they had a cash outflow of 14.5 billion, mainly from this business combination. Most of the other numbers cancel each other out. In their financing section, they raised 8 billion of debt. They paid down 1.2 billion of convertible debt. This is debt of the company Slack. 
and they received 1.3 billion from their employees to buy stock in a company. In their financing section in 2022, they had a cash inflow of 8 billion. Last year, it was a cash inflow of 1.2 billion. This is the equity section on the 131 balance sheet. They have 58 billion of equity. They raised 51 billion from selling their business, and they profited 7.4 billion from running their business. Let's look at the capital structure. 58 billion of equity, 14 billion of debt. They're 81% equity, 19% debt and their net debt is 3.4 billion. So they could pay off a big chunk of the debt with the cash on the balance sheet if they wanted to. This blue line is the equity balance since 2015. The red line is the debt balance and the green line is the cash balance. They have a really healthy balance sheet. Their equity grows each year. Their debt was almost non-existent until recently they added a bunch of debt, but they have plenty of cash on their balance sheet to service that debt and to run their business. I gave them a whack of 6.27%, and that's a discount rate we're gonna apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated a terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four, that's 236 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $199 billion. We divide that by 985 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of 202. They're trading at 207, so they're trading at a 3% premium. It's a sell according to the model. Last week when the company reported earnings, the CEO said his target revenue for 2023 is 32.1 billion. That's a growth of 23% from 2022. But I don't think they can grow 23% for the next few years. So I gave them a growth rate of 10% up through 2026 and then 2.5% into perpetuity. That's how I got their future revenue estimates. To get their future free cash flows, I need to see what percent of their revenue they convert to free cash flow. So I summed up these four free cash flow numbers and I divided by the sum of these four revenue numbers. And that comes out to 20%. So I multiplied their future revenue estimates by 20%. That's how I got their future free cash flows. And I think it's a fairly conservative model, but that means they need to hit close to 9 billion of free cash flow by 2026. That's a pretty big jump from these prior years. The website Simply Wall Street is a lot higher than me. They're at 350 a share. They're saying the stock is 40% undervalued. 27 analysts price this stock and the average is 303. The low is 225, the high is 375. This is where the stock has been trading the last five years. It was below $100 five years ago. Then it broke through 300 just a few months ago, but it's come down about 30% since the peak. So this could be a good time to buy it because I don't think there's that much downside left. I do think there's a decent chance it's going back to 300 this year. In the past five years, this stock has done much better than the S&P 500. At its peak, it was up over 250%, but even with the decline, it's up 150% in five years, while the S&P is up 84%. The stock is up only 2.5% in the past 52 weeks, while the S&P is up 16%. The 52-week low is 184, the high is 312 and the stock is on a decline trading below its 50 day and 200 day moving average. This is a really popular stock. Over 7 million shares have been traded each day the past three months and over 9 million the past 10 days. Of the 985 million shares outstanding, 953 million are on float, 80% are held by institutions and 1.5% of the shares are shorted. The only stock split they did was in 2013, a four for one stock split. Their employee count goes up a lot each year. They currently employ 57 thousand people. If you invested $10,000 into this company 10 years ago, you'd have $60,000 today. That's a 20% annual return. In the past 12 months, there's been no insider buying, just selling. Mark Benioff is the CEO of the company. He sold 68,000 shares. These are the dates of the sales, the person, the number of shares, and the price. 79% of the company is held by institutions, 18% by the general public, and 3% by insiders. Vanguard is the biggest shareholder at 8%, then BlackRock, Fidelity, State Street, and T. Rowe Price. Let's look at their financial ratios. They have a really high PE of 141. They also have a high price to sales of eight and a good price to book of 3.5. Price to book is stock price over book value per share. The way you calculate book value per share is equity over shares outstanding. Equity is on the balance sheet, it's assets minus liabilities. It's the value of the company according to the balance sheet. So they have 58 billion of equity, but only 1.2 billion of tangible equity. 
They have so many intangible assets due to all the acquisitions. Let's look at their non-current assets. 3 billion of property and equipment, 3 billion of operating leases, 2.3 billion of capitalized revenue contracts, 5 billion of strategic investments. I know the company has been trying to acquire a lot of cloud-based businesses. 48 billion of goodwill. Goodwill is the premium you pay when you acquire another company. 9 billion of other intangible assets. This can be computer software, trademarks, copyrights, and 2.6 billion of deferred tax assets. This will help reduce their tax bill in the future. Let's look at their non-current liabilities. 11 billion of debt. Since it's in the non-current section, this is debt that's owed beyond 12 months. 2.7 billion of operating leases and 2 billion of other. Their current ratio and quick ratio are slightly above one. That's current assets over current liabilities. Let's look at their current assets. Five and a half billion of cash, five billion of marketable securities. These are short-term liquid securities, such as commercial paper. 10 billion of receivables. This is how much money other companies owe them. One and a half billion of capitalized revenue contracts and 1.1 billion of prepaid expenses. This is when Salesforce prepaid for a product or service they're gonna receive in the future. Let's look at their current liabilities, five and a half billion of accounts payable. This is how much money Salesforce owes other companies, 686 million of operating leases, and 16 billion of unearned revenue. They generated over five billion of free cash flow in 2022, and they have over one billion of working capital. So the company does seem to be well capitalized. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to companies in the same industry. There are 248 companies in the same industry as CRM. And CRM is the largest company in terms of market cap. All their ratios are better than average except PE. But earnings are a bit wonky due to all the accounting rules. So I like to look at price to free cash flow and price to sales. And both of those are better than average. And their annual growth rate in the past three years is 26%, which is really impressive. It's hard to grow by that percentage when you're so big. So to summarize, I have them trading at a 3% premium, but if you really like this company, it could be a good time to buy the stock because I don't know if there's that much more downside. It's a really solid company, so I think it's a good long-term hold. I rank their free cash flows 9 out of 10, their revenue 9 out of 10, and their ratios 3 out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.